Dinosaurs. What are they? I think we would all agree that that is a dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex, the most iconic of them all. But what about this? A mosasaur, a giant sea creature that lived 70 million years ago. Is that a dinosaur? Let's take a vote. Let's see a show of hands. Who thinks that's a dinosaur? What about this? A giant flying reptile that lived in the Mesozoic. Who thinks that's a dinosaur? What about crocodiles? Are they dinosaurs? What about this? A little fuzzy penguin. Who thinks that's a dinosaur? Well, before I tell you what I think, let's talk about how paleontologists define what a dinosaur is. Dinosaurs are distinct from their reptilian ancestors by their enhanced vigor and power. They were active creatures with an upright stance and limbs tinged for straight ahead forward motion. Now contrast this with the languid, sprawling posture of other reptiles like this lizard. And you can see that uh, it's true, lizards, they're capable of blinding bursts of speed, but they spend much of their day in torpor, always about half a push-up away from taking a nap. So the answers, mosasaurs, big scary sea creatures that lived along with the dinosaurs, not dinosaurs. They do not possess the requisite anatomy to be dinosaurs, and they branch off before there was the first dinosaur. Pterosaurs, like the pterodactyls that you see in all of the children's books about dinosaurs, not dinosaurs. Again, they don't have the anatomy to be dinosaurs, and they branch off before there is the first dinosaur. Crocodiles are the closest living relatives to dinosaurs, but they are not dinosaurs. And that little fuzzy penguin, that is a dinosaur. <laughs> now, what's that you say? How can a little fuzzy penguin be a dinosaur just like a T-Rex? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm here to tell you that common sense is a poor guide to understanding the universe, and always has been. You know, you go out at night, and you see the stars going around the Earth, and you go out in the day, and you see the sun going around the Earth. Well, that's not the way it works, right? The sun is at the center of the solar system. It's not common sense, but it's true. And a penguin is a dinosaur, and that's not common sense, but it's also true, and I'll explain why. So we know dinosaurs mostly from their fossil skeletons, and so we can define what a dinosaur is based on their skeletal anatomy. And when we do that, when we find the very first dinosaur, we say that that dinosaur and 100% of his descendants, that's the group we're going to call dinosaurs. And we call that a clade. A clade is a single branch on the tree of life. And so if you go back to the first dinosaur, that's about 231 million years ago. And guess what? That's not very long ago. That's only about 5% of Earth history ago. I know that sounds remarkable, but if you take the whole four and a half billion year history of the Earth and you crunch it down to a single calendar year with the Earth starting on January 1st, well, we don't get life on Earth until March of this year. We don't get multicellular life like jellyfish until the summer of this year. And then the fossil record really doesn't get good until hard-bodied life evolves. That's a half a billion years ago. That's the end of November on this calendar. And during all this time, life is confined to the oceans. And life finally invades the continents in early December. And then those first dinosaurs, 231 million years ago, remember I told you that's not very long ago? Well, that's the second week of December on this calendar. And dinosaurs dominate the continents for 165 million years until they're all wiped out, except for the birds, by a giant asteroid that hits off the coast of Mexico 65 million years ago. That's Christmas Eve. And then our ancestors, like Australopithecus, called Lucy, six million years ago, well, they show up at 3.30 in the afternoon on December 31st. And our species, Homo sapiens, 200,000 years ago, appears on the last night of the year at 1159.59. There's some perspective for you. So if we take that first dinosaur and 100% of its descendants, 
That's the group we call dinosaurs. And by analogy, we can look at a human family tree. So let's take great, great, great grandmother Polly here. And I think we would all agree that Polly and her children and grandchildren and so forth, that constitutes the Polly family. If you have Polly for an ancestor, you're in the Polly family. Now take a look down on the bottom right hand corner. See little baby Sally there? She has Polly for an ancestor. Could we kick her out of the Polly family? No, we can't do that, right? There's no basis for doing that. That would be completely arbitrary. The Polly family has to be her and 100% of her descendants. If you look at that same logic with dinosaurs, you take the first dinosaur and 100% of their descendants, you can see who's in that group. All of the dinosaurs, including the birds. So you might say, okay, we can see that birds evolve from dinosaurs, but should we still call them dinosaurs? I mean, at some point, shouldn't we say they stopped being di uh, dinosaurs and became just birds? Well, no. When our ancestors evolved into humans, we didn't stop being primates, did we? We were not stripped of our membership in the club of mammals. Our animalness was not revoked. We remained all of those things. And a chicken is a bird and a dinosaur by virtue of the fact that it has dinosaur ancestors. And like all dinosaurs, it can trace its ancestry back to the very first one. Now let me introduce you to another dinosaur. This is one that I found in southernmost Patagonia in Argentina, and my crew and I labored for many years to get this out of the ground, Dreadnoughtus shrani. Dreadnoughtus was 85 feet, 26 meters from snout to tail. It stood two and a half stories at the shoulder, and all fleshed out in life, it would have weighed 65 tons. That's the mass of 13 African elephants. That's the mass of nine T-Rex. That's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. So let's ask this question. Who is more closely related, a big dinosaur like Dreadnoughtus and a Stegosaurus, or a Dreadnoughtus and a little tiny hummingbird? And to answer that question, we can look back in the family tree of dinosaurs and we can see who has the most recent common ancestor. And when we do that, we can see that we do not have to go as far back to find the common ancestor of Dreadnoughtus and all birds, like a hummingbird, as we do to find the common ancestor of Dreadnoughtus and a dinosaur like Stegosaurus. So it's Dreadnoughtus and the hummingbird that are the two more closely related animals. And in fact, all of the dinosaurs on that side of the dinosaur family tree, the giants and all of the meat eaters and all of the birds are all more closely related to each other than they are to any of the dinosaurs on the other side. So now let's look at another example. A lobe fin fish called a coelacanth, and a rainbow trout, and a human. And we can ask the same question, who's more closely related? And again, we can look back in their family trees to see who has the most recent common ancestor. And when we do that, you do not have to go back as far in time to find the common ancestor of the coelacanth and the human, and indeed all limbed animals, as you do to find the common ancestor of the coelacanth and the rainbow trout, but these are living creatures, right? So we can get their DNA, and we can sequence it, and we can test this idea molecularly. And there's a great website called Time Tree, written by a friend of mine, Blair Hedges. And you can type in the common names for animals, and it will show you their most recent common ancestor. And when you do that, you can see that, that the coelacanth and humans have a common ancestor at 412 million years ago, but you have to go all the way back to 430 years 430 million years ago to find the common ancestor of the coelacanth and the rainbow trout. So if we go back way to the Cambrian period, half a billion years ago, and find the first fish and take 100% of its descendants, well, you can see who's in that group. All of the fish, including the limbed animals. So we are members of many nested groups. We are humans and apes and primates and mammals, and reptiles, and amphibians, and fish. Each of us, a menagerie. Each of us, a walking museum of natural history. Our DNA, like the city of Rome, was built and rebuilt by countless forebears, some known and some forgotten. A shovel full of sand, a single blow with a hammer, a passageway moved a bit to the left over time. The changes add up. And within each of our ancestral groups, our membership is complete. 
These are binary distinctions. You're either in or you're out. There are no half apes. There are no half fish. We are apes, that's pretty obvious, but we are also fish. Granted, highly derived fish, but fish nonetheless, and so are dinosaurs. During 92% of our evolutionary history, the ancestors of fish and the, an the ancestors of humans and the ancestors of dinosaurs were the same. Born of bacteria in the Archean Oceans 3.8 billion years ago, our lineage is shared with dinosaurs and with all other animals throughout most of Earth history. The future existence then of all backbone animals teetered on a knife edge when our tiny, wormy Cambrian ancestors managed to survive in the seas a half a billion years ago. When our lobe fin fish ancestors stood their ground along the tangled mangroves of the Devonian shore, the fate of all limbed animals rested on their newly evolved shoulders. And it was in the steamy forests of the Carboniferous period, 320 million years ago, that the path of our ancestors and dinosaur ancestors finally diverged. When two distinct reptilian groups, the sauropsids and the synapsids, emerged from our common stock, our one road through time was irrevocably torn asunder. Evolution is a one-way street. Once parted, avenues can never be rejoined. It would be another 89 million years before the sauropsids would produce the first dinosaurs. 21 million years later, synapsids would produce the first mammals. Like a tropical typhoon propagated from a low pressure cell, swept into being by a single flap of a butterfly wing, the events set into motion by the sauropsid synapsid split were imperceptible at first, but would forever change the world. Each of these groups would go on to conquer the planet, the Seropsids first, until the tables were turned by an asteroid impact. Imagine what a different planet this would be if the common ancestor of humans and dinosaurs had gone extinct before the split. There would never be dinosaurs or any birds, never mosasaurs, never turtles, never snakes, never crocodiles. If the synapsid side fails, never whales, never rodents, Never lions, never camels, never bats, never humans, never you. Throughout my career working on various aspects of Earth history, my awe for the role of contingency in the unfolding of our planet's story has continued to grow. Nearly every day, I am thunderstruck by the what-ifs, by the alternative histories that never came to be. Every species exists only because innumerable, minuscule events happen at just the right moment in time and in just the right sequence. Perturb something here, delay an event there, reorder a single step in an obscure sequence, or shift a continent this way or that, and Earth history forever more changes. A single sunbeam causing a single mutation is all that it takes. A space rock nudged an infinitesimal degree to the left or right could change the course of all that has yet to pass. Kill off an inauspicious wolf-like creature along the ancient shores of Pakistan, and today, there are no whales. Shift the winds one way or another across North Africa six million years ago, and humans evolve or do not evolve as, as forests turn to grasslands or not. The contingencies are endless and mind-boggling, an infinite kaleidoscope of things and events interacting with one another in ways that we may never fully understand, everything matters. And the more I contemplate the improbability of my existence and of your existence, the more gratitude I feel for being alive and for being human and for living now in an amazing age of wondrous technology and ever-expanding understanding, an age in which we can conceive of and affect a better future for all of us and for our planet. Thank you.